recorded to later. So this is the Thinking Grow Rich lesson. We're going to go over faith, desire, and the preface. It is September 28, 2022. And I, Bert Hernandez, I'm so happy and grateful. So one of the things that I use is an app called GoodNotes. There's another one called Notability. And one of the things that I enjoy is that with this app, I can not only highlight, but I can also write my text with my Apple Pencil. So I don't know if you've been in my group in the past, you know that I had Cactus Jack Barringer as one of our guest speakers. If you'll go to the YouTube channel, you'll be able to see that call. It was an audio, but you'll be able to listen to that call. And one of the things that he said, which was something I wrote down and remembered, is if you want to possess it, you must obsess it. In other words, you must make your desire for whatever it is you want in your life, money, a home, an education, whatever your goal is, you must obsess about it. So let's talk about obsessing. How do we create an obsession? Does anybody know? Remember that. Being, that, hab being habitual. I mean, I mean, with your habits. Okay. I suppose. All right. Anybody else? Think about it all the time. That's closer to the fire, as they say. You're getting warmer and warmer. Anybody else have any input on how do we obsess about something? Space repetition and strong feelings. Space repetition, yes. So let me equate the easiest uh, example that I can give is when you, if you've ever fallen in love, you know, for some of us, it was, you know, we were 15, 16 years old. For other of us who were divorced, uh, it has been many times since then. But the process is always the same, right? You wake up in the morning and what do you think about? You think about them. And during the course of the day, what do you think about? You think about them. And before, and if you're not going to see them that night, what do you end up doing? You end up calling them, FaceTiming them, or texting them, right? In the old days, you know, prior to everybody wanting to text everybody, it was on the phone, right? I remember my sister used to talk to her future husband on the phone. And back then we had one of those kitchen phones with the long cords. Anybody remember those? They wouldn't give my sister a prince of her own line. So she had to use the kitchen line. So we had a really long line that ran from the kitchen to her bedroom. Her bedroom was on the same level. And what I would do is I'd go sneak in and I'd wait till she put the phone on her ear, holding it with her shoulder, if you remember how to do that. As soon as she did that, I'd yank on the cord and the phone would come flying out of her, out of her uh, shoulder and onto the floor. And, and the next thing you'd hear is, Mom! So we can't do that anymore. So, you know, that's half of the fun of growing up in that era is being able to tease your sister when she's uh, on the phone with somebody. So the process of falling in love is exactly the process of obsessing. You must fall in love with your goal. That means you must think about it morning, noon, and night. So what is the process that Napoleon Hill suggests for creating an obsessive love for your goals? Anybody wanna share it with us? Nobody knows? Come on. You must have read the book at least once, right? What is the principle that Napoleon Hill said will help us to obsess about something? Auto-suggestion. Auto that is correct. Auto-suggestion is the key, by the way. You must auto-suggest. So if I read, so what is auto-suggestion? If I read the Thinking Grow Rich 10 to 15 times, am I auto-suggesting? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Auto-suggestion is just repetition. How do you get good at riding a bike? You ride it once and you're an expert? Practice, practice, practice. That's right. I remember you know, going to the gym and I lifted a dumbbell once and right away my arms were 20 inches and made out of steel. Just one rep did that. You know, when I started training for bodybuilding years ago, I went to uh, Pat, who was a uh, IFBB professional bodybuilder. And I said, how long will it take me to build a, a, a decent physique? You know, he said five years. And of course, my answer was, what? 
And he said, that's what it's going to take because you have to first build a base of muscle and then you become, as you get stronger and stronger, it's not like in 30 days or 90 days, that shit is, doesn't happen. So it's going to take five years of consistent workouts to build a strong body, a bodybuilder physique. So remember the, the key to, to, you know, the key to everything in life is repetition. Auto suggestion is the tool that will change your life. Your subconscious mind is the power mind. The conscious mind is not powerful at all. You, you can't remember 15 numbers. You can't, most people can't do it long math in their head. That's why you have to write it down because the conscious mind cannot do that type of work. It can, it can make decisions, but what's the best way to make a decision to, to do it in our heads or to write it down on a piece of paper? Anybody know? Yeah. Write it down. Write it, write it down. When, when you're, do, when a, when a, a, a mathematician is going to do math, he does the math in his head or does he write it down? He writes it down, right? You can't solve problems in your head. You don't have, your conscious brain doesn't have the computing power to do it. It's got very limited RAM. What happens every night when you go to bed? Who goes to sleep? The and conscious you, mind. The conscious mind. That's it. Your subconscious doesn't go to sleep, does it? If it did, you'd stop breathing. That's called death. So your subconscious mind is always on. It's always working. It's on 24 seven. So this is one of my favorite um, testimonials. Uh, the gentleman basically says that he followed the six step formula and it helped him to realize that there was a way, even if an uneducated lunkhead like me to make, to make it like the big guys. I followed the success formula faithfully and lo and behold, my life turned around. Two of the most useful tools in the book are the poem, My Wage, I Bargain With Life For A Penny, and that's all I thought she would bear. And if you think you're beaten, you are. If you dare not, you don't. Um, and I truly believe that Dr. Hill's message uh, is the same as the message in the Bible. It's just a little easier for me to apply. I went on to build the largest cemetery organization in the country, starting out from my basement, on Concord Avenue in Anderson, South Carolina in 1970. We sold 30 cemeteries to Service Corporation International, making it possible for them to become the largest funeral cemetery company in the world. I served as president of their cemetery division for three years. I am now 85 years old, living comfortably on the shores of Lake Hartwell with my wife of 65 years. Almost all my good fortune came about because I had the good fortune to be introduced to thinking grow rich in 1953. I have given away many cases of this great book. It was required reading in my company and in my family. And it has made the difference in a lot of the people's lives who were given the opportunity to make it part of their lives. Now that's not the first person that has ever given away copies of thinking grow rich. W. Clement Stone in 1939, bought a thousand copies of thinking grow rich. Now that's when they were, they was no, there were, there wasn't any paperbacks back then. It was only hardcover. Paperback is a relatively new invention for not for us today, but back then didn't exist. So hardcover books were expensive. And of course, in 1939, we had just come out of a, re a depression that took 10 years for us to get out of. How did we get out of the depression? Does anybody know? The changing, they changed uh, the way that everything was in the news. A lot of the different uh, clergymen and, yep. and, and instead of saying depression, they wrote recovery instead, changing what, the mindset. What FDR did is he created the biggest job program in history. Do you know what that jobs program was called? He gave every man a job and every woman too. It was called World War II. That was the jobs program. The military and the government were the largest employer. So everybody's getting three squares and, and free clothing and housing, right? So you can't complain. So that was how we actually came out of the depression. One of many, but the, the biggest one. Uh, okay, so 
I would suggest, as I did, to take that poem, if you think you beat your arm, you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. For out of this world, we find that it all begins with a fellow's will. It's all in a state of mind. So it, I took that poem and I hand wrote it because back then we didn't have uh, computers to type in. And I hand wrote it and taped it to the wall in my bedroom. My wife at that time uh, kept tearing it down. Eventually, she got tired of me putting it back up again and did and went and got it made by a calligrapher, put it in a nice frame and put it on the first at the bedroom wall and then on the foyer of her home. And I established a new habit. And that was that I would read that poem out loud before I would leave the house in the morning. And the first thing when I came back in at night, when I was done for the day, I read that poem twice a day for five years. Now, do I tell you that to impress you or to impress upon you what principles? What were the three principles that I used? Out of suggestion and persistence. Right. And what was the first one? Start with anything else. Huh? Repetition. Decision. Oh. I had to okay. decide to do it, right? Sure. Most people can't make a decision. So I decided to do it. And then I used auto suggestion and persistence because I did it for five years. Mm -hmm. And today, for the most part, I can still remember the poem. When you do it that many times, you tend to remember things. So when I had somebody tell me, when will I internalize my statement so that I can manifest it? Does anybody know the answer to that? What has to happen before you can manifest what you write down in your definite main purpose statement? You got to believe it. Got to believe it. You have to become it. You have to become. So let me, so let me tell you this. When you go to school and you, what do you do in order to be able to take a test effectively? Study. 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 And what are you doing when you're studying? Does the word memorizing come into play at all? Mm -hmm. You're memorizing what? The information, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that you know it. If you, you can memorize it. All right, let's go that way. Does it, has anybody here ever done any kind of acting? Yeah. Okay, yeah. do you know what the term on book and off book means? No. Okay, so in acting, they will have rehearsals, right? And they when they first do a rehearsal, it'll be called on book. That means that the players, the actors, will rehearse while reading the script book, okay? So when you're reading the script book, you're not effective in doing what? Acting, because where's your head at? In acting or in reading the words? It's on the page. It's on the page. So they do it on book until the people have memorized it and then it's called a rehearsal off book which means that you will not be using the script book. You will do the, the performance from memorization. What does memorizing something allow you to do? Think of something simple like driving your car. Is that memorized? Yeah. Yeah. All habits are memorization, aren't they, really? Mm -hmm. So does that, the fact that you memorized how to drive, does that allow you to turn on the radio? To listen yeah. to the radio, to work an app, to put on Google Maps. It allows you to do many things. But ma imagine being a beginner driver and trying to put on Spotify, to turn on Google Maps, and to, ch and to have a conversation with somebody. Not going to happen easily. It, it can happen, but it won't happen easily. Why? Because you haven't yet created the habit through repetition of driving. Today... I see people, you know, putting on makeup while they're driving on the highway. You know, it's insane what people attempt to do. And if you, and people have told me, oh, I can multitask. And I say, no, you can't. Because if you could multitask, I want you to go on I-4 here in Florida, go 90 miles an hour, which is the normal speed here in Florida, and text everybody, text your whole family and see if you don't end up killing yourself. 
What we can multitask are things that we already memorized from doing, but things that still take conscious attention uh -uh, won't happen. So this is the most important statement I believe that Napoleon Hill ever put out. Can somebody read it? Come on, get those vocal cords warmed up. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. That's right. So let's break that down. So what does that really mean? What the mind, whatever the mind can conceive, what is conceive? What does that mean? You create an imagine. idea. Yeah, imagination. Okay. So in, in Napoleon Hill's language, conceive, he says, is any plan, purpose, or desire. Whatever plan, pur purpose, desire, or plan that you can conceive of, once you believe it, you will be able to achieve it. Does that make sense? It does. If you can so let's say that I conceive, let's say I conceive that I want to lose 30 pounds. And I say, I want to lose 30 pounds and I go right to achieve it. So I join a gym, I buy some diet food and I start using my willpower to lose weight. Do most people succeed with that strategy? No. No, the reality is they don't. They'll lose some weight and then what happens? They quit. Why? Because what didn't change? The belief. The belief. How do we change belief? Repetition. Repetition of orders or commands to the subconscious mind is the only known way of creating belief. The only known way. That's how advertisers got us to think that Crest is toothpaste, Mustang is a car, and Tide is a detergent through repetition. We discussed that last week. So the formula is simple. You must repeat your statement out loud with emotion long enough so that your subconscious mind begins to believe that you can accomplish it. So what happens if we repeat something that we don't believe? Will we eventually, because of the repetition, believe it? Yeah. I yeah. Believe so. yeah. Yeah. That's exactly how we believe all that we believe through repetition. So let me just uh, jump to here. Okay. So let's go to the forward by Bob Proctor. Okay. So Bob Proctor in 1963, his brother handed him a gift which was a leather bound copy of Thinking Grow Rich. He started reading Thinking Grow Rich when he was 28 years old. Does everybody know who Bob Proctor is? Yeah. Okay, so if you don't, write down his name and Google him. He passed away back in February of this year. Um, he was like, I think 87, 88 years old. And he'd been studying Thinking Grow Rich for over 55 years by the time he passed away. So he read Thinking Grow Rich and what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. He went, he, he was given a copy of Thinking Grow Rich by a guy by the name of uh, Robert Stanford. He was 26 years old. And uh, bear with me for a second here. He was 26 years old. He had no formal education, no business experience. And he was $6,000 in debt. And he was making $4,000 a year as a fireman in Canada. Mm -hmm. He started, he wrote down his goal on a card and he began carrying it with him. He began reading it out loud and he began reading it anytime that he could. What was he doing while he was doing that process? Scrubbing floors. Huh? He was, he was scrubbing floors. Is that what you mean? No, no. What was he doing? It. What was that? What is that process called that he was doing? Oh, my bad. Auto suggestion. Auto suggestion. You understand where I'm going with this? Auto suggestion. Mm -hmm. Everything is auto suggestion. So he began with no formal education, no business experience. And because he was reading the card out loud and to himself multiple times a day, he was now focused on making money. His first goal was to have in his possession $25,000. And he gave himself 10 years. He said he didn't know anybody that had $25,000 in the firehouse or in, in the town that he lived in. 
So to him, 25,000 was like to somebody saying, I'll have a billion dollars. It was just inconceivable, but he kept repeating it. And through repetition, he began reading each chapter over and over again. And that's how he began to develop a healthy respect for my potential and my capabilities. Eventually, he, he began clean floors. You were right, Lisa. And he started a little business. He got his uh, grandfather to lend him the money. It was like 900 bucks. He bought a bucket of uh, a, a floor, a vacuum cleaner and some other utensils. But, and he began getting accounts to go clean them. The money was not in cleaning the floors. The money was in getting the accounts. The first year that he did this, he earned $75,000. And within five years, he was making over a million dollars a year. And he was doing business in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, New in uh, London, England, and other parts of the world. He was in multiple countries doing office cleaning. All because he wrote down on a card what he wanted. I'm sure that that card changed over the years. He also says something that is really important. I'd like you all to think about it and write it down. And that is that he formed a habit that he would urge you. And that is to read the chapter on persistence every day for 30 days, at least twice a year. Now, my mentor, Lou Segro, I was in his mastermind for three years. He had us do it once a year. He had us do it with the chapter on auto suggestion, the chapter on persistence, the chapter on the mastermind and the chapter on uh, decision. So I've read those chapters more than every other chapter in this book, uh, because that's just, you know, once a quarter, we would read one of those on top of our regular reading. In that three years that I was in the group, by the structure, I would have read the book 12 times. I read it over 25 times. I still read this book every day. And as you can see, I like to uh, highlight a lot of stuff and I like this new app that I'm using called Good Notes. So let's talk about the secret. We discussed it last week, but here it is again. This book contains a secret after having been put to a practical test by thousands of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula, which gave him a stupendous fortune, ought to be placed within the reach of everyone who does not have time to investigate how successful people make money. Does anybody know what are the six steps in the formula? If you don't, shame on you. One of the things that I asked you to do last week was to write out, type it out, the six steps and put it somewhere where you'll see it at least once a day. Why is that important? Does anybody know? Nobody knows? Okay. Is the seat, do you have the seat of success or not really? Like, do you really want to succeed or not really? If you want to succeed, what should you do? Do things over and over and over again. Should you do some things or everything? Everything. Everything. Why? When I suggest something, am I suggesting it because it's going to hurt you or help you? Help you. Help you. How long will it take to write out that formula? Two hours, five hours, a day, three weeks, a month? How long do you think it'll take to write down six simple steps? Five minutes. Yeah, or less, right? All right. So this, um, the steps now, you mean like first decide, you got to decide. Is first that step is... Uh, the first step is decide what, what goal you want to achieve. Well, how much money mm -hmm. be specific as to the amount. All right. The second step is to put it, to create a plan and a deadline for that step. Step three is to begin writing it out and we'll go over that in a minute, but mm -hmm. you know, you'll find that in the chapter on desire. So yep. his son, he says, while this book was being written, my own son who was then finishing the last chap chap a year of his college work picked up the manuscript of chapter one. The original version says chapter two because there is no, ch the chapter one is really the introduction. So chapter two is the chapter on desire. And in this version, 
chapter one is the chapter on desire. He read it and discovered the secret for himself. He used the information so effectively that he went directly into a responsible position at a beginning salary greater than the average person earned. He did that as a result of just using the formula. And he calls it the Carnegie secret. And he tells us that the secret has not been directly named. He says here, somewhere as you read, the secret to which I refer will jump from the page and stand boldly before you if you are ready for it. When it appears, you will recognize it. Now the secret comes in two parts. So he says, as a final word of preparation, before you begin the next chapter, may I offer, may I offer a, um, uh, a brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized. It is this, all achievement, all earned riches have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. So if you study that, yeah. and, and what do I mean by study? Read it every day for 30 days until, it may, until you discover the secret for yourself. Now you know it, but you still need to discover it. You have to affirm it to yourself. So what is it? It's one, it's having an idea. How will you know when you possess the second half? When you have a desire. So the first step is to have an idea, a plan or purpose, and two is to create a desire for it. How do you create a burning desire? Auto suggestion. That's right. When you fall in love, what happens? Do you fall in love because you don't see each other? Do you fall in love because you don't talk to each other? Or is it because you're constantly talking to each other and being next to each other? Yep. There's the answer. So success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. So if we don't make a decision to become success conscious, we will by default become failure conscious. Can anybody tell me why what I just said is true or untrue? Because if, if you become you what you think about so how do you become success conscious? And success. And if our goal is to have money, what should we think about? Money. Think money are ways to get money. Now the original version, he doesn't say success conscious. He says money conscious. You see, if you don't plant the seed for money in your mind, by default, You're going to have not a failure consciousness, but what if Napoleon Hill said? A poverty consciousness. That's what he said in the actual text. How will we get a poverty consciousness? If you think about debt, you're going to bring about more debt. That's true. Where, where, what, what, how do we get programmed? Does anybody know what a paradigm is? Yeah. How do we get programmed? Uh, from our parents, our environment when we're born. Yeah. We start out being programmed by our environment, by our parents, by well-meaning friends, relatives, aunts, uncles, school teachers, siblings. And by age seven, for a great part of us, our self-image has already been formed. Then from seven forward, who programs us? Our schools, churches, yeah, our environment. Mm -hmm. What is the first People. thing that every communist leader does? Do you know? After he kills off all his uh, opponents, do you know the first thing he does? Or she? Hasn't been. I don't think there's been any female dictators yet. Perhaps there was, and I don't know. But so let's take a look at what, for example, let's take Castro for example. Uh, everybody know who Castro is, right? the famous revolutionary leader of the Cuban revolution, who was a communist, correct? Mm -hmm. Everybody agree that he was a communist? Yep. 
So when Castro was took over Cuba in 1956, they asked him how he was going to maintain power. How long would the revolution last? He said these words, I only need 20 years. Does anybody know what he meant by that? Why did he only need 20 years? Anybody here 30 or 40 years old? What happens in 20 years? Does the current generation become take power in 20 years? Oh. Yeah. They That's become the workforce, point. don't they? In yeah. 20 years, what happens to the, the, the children that are now newly born? They're running. They're, they're, they're running for the most things. part, they start, they begin to run things. So why did he say he needed 20 years? Because what's going to happen with those children in a communist country or America? What do we do with our kids once they reach the age of five? Send them to school. And what happens in school? They, they learn from teachers. They learn they from become, other kids. They become propagandized. Don't get it any other way. All schools are a form of propaganda. Good propaganda, bad propaganda, doesn't really matter. Schools are a way to teach children what you want them to believe. What did Castro realize? That he just needed 20 years to take that young generation and mold them into good communists. And what would happen in 20 years to all the people that weren't brought up under communism? They'd be out of power. Yeah. So understand that the school system is designed to create propaganda to teach us what they want us to learn. Do you think that it's that we learn the skills that we need in life in school? No. Not one I, bit. <laughs> we learn how to be good employees. Yeah. That's it. We're not taught to think for ourselves until we get into higher education. In school, back in my day, you were told to put your hands on your desk and cross your hands, cross your fingers. If you did something wrong, you were punished. And you were taught basics like reading and writing and arithmetic. And then you were told every morning, what? I pledge allegiance to the flag. What's that? How does, what does that have to do with education? The Pledge of Allegiance. Absolutely nothing. Is it a form of pro uh, programming then? I think it. I think it is. I guess. Yeah, programming. So, let's fast forward here a little bit. That's okay. interesting. <laughs> I know. If you want to really learn about propaganda, propaganda started in World War One, but it was really taken to heart in World War Two. Not only did Nazi Germany use propaganda, but so did Stalin and so did Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, and so did the United States. If you look back, if you Google uh, US propaganda during World War II, you'll see all the posters, you know. What was the belief or the propaganda statement? Is it anybody who is a history major hopefully will know this? What was, why did we not accept Japan's surrender after we dropped the bomb on uh, Nagasaki? Why didn't we accept their surrender? Yeah, cool. It goes back to, an, to a propaganda statement that FDR had said to everyone. We would accept Japan's surrender under what conditions? Not too many history buffs here? Okay. So the statement was, we will accept Japan's surrender unconditionally. Do you know what un an unconditional surrender means? Anybody? Uh, unconditional. They... That means no deals. No deals. You surrender to, to our will completely. You submit. Okay, no negotiations, no treaties. 
No, nothing. So after they dropped the first bomb, Fat Boy, on Nagasaki, Japan surrendered, but they surrendered with conditions. FDR would not accept that because the propaganda had been that Japan must surrender unconditionally. And it took a second bomb, which was a hydrogen bomb, and it was dropped on Hiroshima. And after that second bomb, Japan surrendered unconditionally. I also think that we didn't have the third bomb, so it was kind of a good thing that they surrendered on the second one. <laughs> we already had the technology. I'm sure they could have come up with the second Probably. batch of plutonium. The first batch was made with plutonium. The second bomb was made with her with, was a hydrogen bomb, which was ten times greater than the original. It was just wow. much more powerful. Hydrogen bombs are just no joke. Um, We've since then dropped bombs that are a hundred times more powerful than anything we dropped on Japan. Just to give you an idea of where the technology has gone. Uh, for, fortunately, we have. Do you? Does anybody here believe that if Hitler or or um, uh, or the Japanese had their hands on an atomic bomb, would they have dropped that on the United States? Does anybody believe they wouldn't? I believe they would. Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think the distance between us and them, the travel time with the air, air, you know, airplane or fighter jet, I think that's one of our benefits of being having the oceans around us. Would would Germany have the ability to strike us? Yeah. Call V two rockets, right? Yeah. Who started the U.S. Uh, rocket program? Anybody know? Uh -uh. There was there was a uh, mission after World War II called uh, um, um, Operation Paperclip. We realized after the end of World War II that a lot of these Nazi scientists were on the verge of creating rockets that could do a lot of things: inter intergalactic, interballistic missiles, rockets to the sp space. And Operation Paperclip was a way for us to get those scientists out of Germany and into the United States. And one of those scientists was a guy by the name of, uh, oh God, uh, Von Warner. Von Warner was the one that created the Saturn V rocket. Does anybody know what the Saturn V rocket did? Getting a history lesson here today, huh? No kidding. <laughs> Saturn V rocket was what put a, a man on the moon. So if we can launch a ship and take it to the moon, can we easily hit Russia or yeah. Japan or any part of the world we want? Yes. And Germany was only about, they said that Germany was realistically about a month to two months away from developing their own nuclear weapon. And they already had the rockets to be able to, to strike the US. Japan would have taken a little bit longer, but they were sharing information. But Hitler was a neurotic and he didn't like giving anybody else info. All right, so anyway, enough of the history lesson. <laughs> so this is one thing that I wrote down years ago on a little business card. I kept it in my wallet every day. And that was one sign idea is all that one needs to achieve success. If you will auto suggest that you'll begin to believe it. And if you begin to believe it, you'll be looking for one sound idea. So he says, when you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind with definiteness of purpose and with little or no hard work. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Does it really work that way? I believe it does. I, because yeah. once you start, I mean, it's, it's bound to be fun and not work. I mean. Once you decide what you want, the advantage is that you will no longer be conflicted. And more yeah, importantly, amazing. you will you things will manifest. They'll manifest because your subconscious mind will draw things to you. So we're going to skip the story about Barnes and we're going to go right to the most important thing in this chapter. Every individual who reaches the age of understanding the purpose of money wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession. 
then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches and backing those plans with persistence, which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical actions or steps. So first, you must fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. You can't say, I just want more money. You must be specific as to the amount. So your goal for today is to decide what is the amount of money that you want to earn next year by December 31st, 2023. And typically you want to take whatever you, the most money you've ever earned and double it. And then you want to break it down to a monthly number. So if you're, if the most you ever earned was a hundred thousand dollars and now you want to make 200,000 next year, the goal is then to make 83,333 is 100,000. So what's 200,000? 16,666 dollars per month would be your goal. Now you're going to say, but Bert, how am I going to do that? Well, that we don't worry about. The how is not your responsibility. What is your responsibility? Anybody know? What? Hmm? What is your responsibility? To continue to do, read the statement and do That's the right. auto-suggestion. Your, your responsibility is to do step number six. And what, can anybody, somebody read step six for me? Oops, it's right up there. It says, uh, it's underlined. Read, read your written statement aloud twice daily, once just before retiring at night and once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and fail and believe yourself already in possession of the money. So that's one of the reasons why you're directed to memorize the statement. If you can't memorize it yet, then you should record yourself reading it. Because this way, before you go to bed at night, you can close your eyes and let it play while you imagine your life with the amount of money that you desire. You can see yourself successfully doing the work required to achieve that goal. Visualization is a very important part of this process. It, and that's why he basically in the original copy, he and, he and here we have it, is in all caps, as you read, see, feel, and believe yourself already in possession of the money. So you must suspend disbelief. You must believe that you could accomplish this. Now, those are the six steps. I encourage everybody to type them up or handwrite them out and put them somewhere where you'll see them once a day. And I use a printed version. I also have it on my uh, phone. I just, I have an iPhone, so I put it into notes and it's in there. Even though I, I did this, 30 something years ago, and I know it by heart, but it's still, I do the same thing that I tell you to do. Only those who become money conscious ever accumulate great, great riches. Money conscious means that the desire for money has, so, has become thoroughly saturated in your mind so that you see yourself already in possession of it. You're only, the only thing you have to do is affirm your statement and two times is a minimum that's the minimum that you should do you should when bob proctor did it he took his goal card here's my goal card and he and he read it multiple times a day why why do we want to read this multiple times a day so it will become a part of you yeah, because if we're reading it multiple times a day, can we, what happens during the court? What ha, has anybody here ever written a to-do list in the morning and then put it away and never looked at it? And at the end of the day, realize that they got shit done. Anybody ever do that? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I took the Franklin Covey time management program. I took the uh, multiple programs. Uh, I think I took it four times. Prudential paid a bunch of them. And I found out that the most important thing about the Franklin, why the Franklin Covey system worked was two things. One is making a daily to-do list, of course, prioritizing it and all that. And two was putting your planner open on your desk so that you could constantly do what? Look at it. Look at it. 
And if you're looking at the stuff you have to do, like right now, I use a bullet, what I call a bullet journal. It's just a, a journal. And I make a list every day of three things I have to accomplish. And anytime something pops in my head that I need to be done, I add it to my list. But I have it open and on my desk every day. And every day I make a new list and I check what I, cr I cross off what I did yesterday. And the process is that I've tried apps and it does, there's something about being able to, to unplug from the internet and, and to be, basically be able to concentrate on what's written. But that was the secret. If you, if you keep repeating your affirmation or your statement every day and you read it multiple times a day, it's going to be in your conscious mind. And it becomes difficult to procrastinate and you don't get, you know, when people say, oh, life got in the way. Well, if you will read this multiple times a day, life won't get in the way anymore. I read my goal card 25 times a day. That's my, it's a shorter version of my statement. My full statement, I read it five times a day. I don't read it. I say it, it's memorized. Now, some people say, oh, Bert, that's a lot. Well, it takes about a minute and a half to read the goal card. So if I do it 25 times a day in sets of five, that takes 25, 30 minutes, let's call it 30 minutes. Now there's 1,440 minutes in a day. So is it a lot to take 30 minutes to impress upon my mind what I want in my life? Is that a lot of time, really? It's 30 minutes. You spend more time Netflix, doing Netflix, don't we? Doing our, my statement five times a day, my statement's about two minutes long. So that's 10 minutes. So I spend about 35, I'm sorry, 40 minutes to 45 minutes a day doing my auto suggestion. Oh my God. Out of 1,440 minutes, does anybody know what percentage that is? I'm going to calculate it right now because. Looks like 2% or something. Yeah, it's 3% of my day. I spend 3% of my day thinking about my goal, but I do have my goal card on my desk where I can see it. And when I see it, even if I don't read it, what happens in my mind when I see it? You think about it. I think about it. It triggers a response, right? I see it and I go, yeah, hundred thousand dollars. I gotta, I gotta figure that one out. So now when you write down your goal, if it's especially a big goal, it, you may not manifest it right away. It could take six months. It could take a year. It could take two years. It depends on how much past conditioning you have because you have to begin to believe that you can do it. And you have to, and when the, and when you tell other people, they're not going to support you and encourage you. They're going to do the opposite, unfortunately. So let's go to the next chapter. The, the, I want you to read the chapter in desire in full. I'm not going to read it for you, but if we don't focus on having a money consciousness, society will give us a failure consciousness, okay? So let's take a look at the chapter on desire, which is the next, I'm sorry, the chapter on faith. And I suggest that you take this poem, I bargained with life for a penny and life would pay no more. However, I begged at the evening, you can do that one or you can do the one that I like, which is in the chapter on faith. Because what is faith? When Napoleon Hill talks about faith, what is he really talking about? Be be belief. Belief. Yeah, the chapter on faith is belief, right? He says, I believe in the power of desire backed by faith because I've seen this power lift people from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced by what? Auto suggestion. Auto suggestion. If you walk away from today's lesson, remembering one thing, it's that the key to all your success and happiness is in that word auto suggestion. So, faith. So, what is faith? Faith is the head chemist. When we first go after a goal, do we have a great deal of faith in our ability to accomplish it? Another word is belief. No, right? If we already believe that we could accomplish something, would we not have already accomplished it? Correct. Yeah. If I had a perfect plan to accomplish something, wouldn't I already have in my possession that which I want? Yeah. So when we first start out, we're not going to have 
a great plan and we're not going to have a great deal of faith. And that's why most people fail because they don't understand this part of the process. And that is what? That you must first build that belief in yourself and your abilities and in the goal. And that comes through auto suggestion. So here comes now a statement, which will give you a better understanding of the importance of the principle of auto suggestion assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical monetary or equivalent. Faith is a state of mind, which may be induced or created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto suggestion. Now, in this chapter, does he talk about the six steps? The answer is yes. He also tells us that repetition or affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. So what is the only method for creating the emotion of faith? Auto suggestion. That's right. Repetition, auto suggestion. So he tells us that when people first come into contact with crime, they abhor it. If they remain in contact with crime for a time, they become accustomed to it and endure it. If they remain in contact with it long enough, they finally embrace it and become influenced by it. This is the equivalent of saying that any impulsive thought, which is repeatedly passed on to the subconscious mind, is finally accepted and acted upon by the subconscious mind, which begins to translate that impulse into its physical equivalent by the most practical procedure available. What does that mean? Somebody want to give it to me in, in plain English as opposed to Napoleon speak, as I call it? Well, it sounds like it became a uh, repetitious or a habit, I guess. That's how I perceive it. Yeah. Any such, any, uh, any thought, desire, or idea that is repeatedly passed on to the subconscious mind. How do we repeatedly pass that idea to the subconscious mind? What is the word? Auto suggestion. Bingo. Give that man a, a cookie. So what is it saying? That any impulse, any idea, plan, or purpose that is repeatedly passed on to the subconscious mind through auto suggestion is finally accepted and then once it's accepted, it what? It's act upon by the subconscious mind. So let's take a look here. And uh, let me go here. So Bert, are we able to get the this copy that you got, you got highlights? Are we able to get that from you? Or we got to go download the the one. Uh, I, I sent the um, I sent you a copy of this, but it doesn't have my highlighting. I I want you to highlight it and take notes for yourself because that's half the fun. See, I'm a kindergarten dropout. They kicked me out of kindergarten. So every time I get a book, I get a new book. I basically get myself some highlighters. But now with technology, I can do it all on a tablet. So I did not. Excuse me. I did not realize that. Um, think and grow rich different versions are different versions so the the original version is called the 1937 version that's the original version and, and that's, that's the also called the classic can everybody see my screen mm -hmm. so since then this book is supposed to be based on the 1937 version but it has the language has been modernized a little bit which is mm -hmm. fine Okay. It's still the same concept. So here's what we're talking about. So let's take a look. This is your mind. Okay. This was uh, Dr. Van Fleet back in the 1970s came up with an idea to explain the human mind, give a visual image to it. You've seen Bob Proctor, if you follow Bob Proctor using it as well, it's called the stick man figure. So this is what is the mind. And what we've discovered is that the mind consists of two parts. We have the conscious and we have the subconscious. The conscious mind is the smaller of the two. 
it's the smaller brain. This is where we can do critical thinking and we have the ability to reason. The subconscious mind just accepts. It has no power of reasoning or deduction. He, in the conscious mind, we can tell the difference between good or bad. The subconscious mind can't tell the difference. Just accepts. In order to get, but the subconscious mind is a filter, okay? It's the filter before we can get to the subconscious mind. So when we have a new idea, right? We want to become self-employed. We present that idea to our conscious mind. And if we have never been self-employed, what is our conscious mind going to say? No. No. You, you, your parents told you that you're better off working as a fireman or a police driver because you have a nice pension. You put in your 20 years and then you retire, right? The sec job security, right? That's, so if you have been programmed with ideas of job security, you're not going to try it. Let me ask you this. If your father was a fireman or police officer, what are the odds that you'd become a fireman or a police officer? High or low? High. Mm -hmm. So if your dad was self-employed, what are the chances that you will either take over his company or become self-employed yourself? High. High. People who are self children of the self-employed tend to be self-employed. So when we get these ideas, if they don't meet with what our conscious filter says, which is really our self-image, if it doesn't match up with our self-image, we're going to reject it. So what has to happen with that idea? It has to be repeated over and over and over again. And then eventually it trickles into our subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind has, does not have the ability to accept or reject. It only accepts. But what must happen in order to get any idea, and this is be your goal, the money you want, right? In order for that goal to be accepted and acted upon, believe, conceive, conceive, believe, and achieve, right? In order to be acted upon, that goal has to be presented to the subcon to the conscious mind over and over again until eventually it is accepted by the subconscious. And what happens once it's accepted in the subconscious mind? It can become a reality. For you to walk, do you first give yourself a command to walk? No. Yes, you do. Oh. Okay. If you're sitting on the couch, what do you say to yourself? Get up. Yeah. I want to get a beer. I want to get a soda. I want to go to the bathroom. And you get up. But there's a command. See, your body is controlled by what? Your thoughts. Your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your conscious mind can also direct the body, but it's minimal. Who, which part of the brain does your breathing for you? So which part of the brain controls your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart? Subconscious? subconscious? Yeah. So what, what runs your body? Your subconscious. subconscious. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So before we begin acting on it, it must be accepted by our subconscious mind. And that will only happen with auto suggestion or repetition of orders, as Napoleon Hill says here. So it's repetition, which is another word for auto suggestion, repetition over and over and over again until it breaks through. Now, what happens if our in our during our lifetime we've had a lot of negative programming? What if we've been told no 10 million times? What if we failed before? What happens? Do we accept the idea easily or does it take longer? We assume we're going to fail again. It's going to take longer, right? So when people say, I had a guy once, he was 45 years old, lived in London, England, lived with his mother, was making $40,000 a year, wasn't married, didn't have a girlfriend, didn't have children. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Bert, I've been doing the statement now for two weeks and nothing's happened. What's, what was wrong with that statement? Do you know? Two weeks isn't long enough to push out 45 years of negative thinking. You got that right. <laughs> so when I ran 
the way I started doing this is I first did it with myself in, in the mastermind group with Lou. And then once I got to a sales manager, I began teaching my agents. I was a sales manager with Prudential. And I began teaching this to the agents at Prudential that were underneath me. And they were not given a choice on doing this. And every morning we would meet at 8.30 in the office. And if it was summer, we'd go outside and we'd all do our statement together. Uh, if, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't make it to the office, you had to call in and do your statement on the phone with me. That was like a, you know, a, um, what do they call that? Um, a deal breaker. If you can't do that, don't even bother working, you know, working with me. So the thing is that you must get into the habit of doing your statement because it's not until you've done enough repetition. Let me ask you this. Is it, would you say that Tiger Woods is exceptional as a golfer? Yeah, it's amazing. Do you think he would be exceptional if he started playing golf at age 25? No. No. Why? From age three, what did he do? He swung a golf club. <laughs> practice, played, practice. He started practicing and playing golf at age three. How many repetitions would he have by the time he was 25? Countless, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody that walks in to play golf at 25 is never going to equal Tiger Woods because Tiger Woods just has that many more repetitions under his belt. There's a book called The Outliers. And in this book, the author examines the Beatles. And when the Beatles got to America, they were an overnight sensation. Is everybody familiar with that historical tidbit? When they got here, they became an overnight sensation. Everybody know that? Give me a, give me a yes if you know it. Give me a no if you don't. No. Yep. Yeah. And everybody said, how, how was it that the Beatles were able to come here and overnight take over the whole music scene? Well, what the outliers did is they studied the Beatles. And did you know that the Beatles started out playing in bars in London, but they couldn't get enough bookings at local bars. So they took their, their little band to Munich, Germany, and they began playing in beer halls all over Germany. And it took 10,000 hours of playing before they achieved success. It took five years. They spent five years playing anywhere they could. And so when they got here to the United States, they weren't an overnight sensation. They were an overnight sensation that took five years. Because in five years, what were they doing? Playing. Yeah, practicing. Because when you're playing, you're practicing. And in order to play, you have to practice. So it's repetition, repetition, repetition. When you look at any gymnast or Olympic athlete, what is the common thing that they have today in terms of what age they start training? Does anybody know? Does everybody know that gymnasts, that Olympic athletes start training in at a very early age, like four, five, and six? Does everybody know that? No. Yeah, Google it. And these young gymnasts that want to become Olympic athletes, do they join the Olympics team and do cheerleading and play hockey and volleyball and football and basketball? Do they do all that? No. No. What do they do? They concentrate on their one skill they love. One skill, one thing. What do we do for our kids? We let them play basketball. We let them play hockey, organized sports today. When I was growing up, there was no organized sports. Today, there's, everything's organized. So we let them take karate when they watch the Ninja Turtles, and then they take soccer, and they jump from one thing to another, to another, to another, and they never quite get it in their heads that the way to gain mastery is to do one thing over and over again until you have done it long enough that it becomes part of you. Right. We talked about memorization. So when will you when will you know that you're going to manifest your goal? When you've memorized it. Because memorization is the first step. 
Memorization means that I could wake you up at three in the morning and say, hey, what's your goal? And you could go, hey, it's, it's my birthday, February 20th, 2023. And I, Bert Hernandez, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm receiving an excess of $100,000 each and every month from my insurance agency, life coaching, masterminds, insurance and uh, real estate investments and other income streams, right? You can do that like that without thinking about it. I easily and effortlessly accomplish my daily task by creating an imperative report list daily, 30 contacts per day, 15 presentations per day, and five new clients per week, thus ensuring my success. I am a disciplined, organized, scheduled, responsible, punctual, single-minded, and laser-focused leader that gets things done on time or before. I'm a worthy, deserving, gorgeous, and beautiful man that is open to receive all that has been given to me and more. As a result of my dedicated effort and laser focus, I am now experiencing love, sex, joy, happiness, fun, romance, time, and financial freedom, abundance, peace of mind, and excellent health. When you can do that, you will be closer to manifesting what you want. But as long as you don't do the repetition, you can stop dreaming because you got to read the book and you got to do your statement. So one of the gifts that I'm going to send you by email tomorrow or later tonight, probably tomorrow, is a copy of Earl Nightingale's version of Thinking Grow Rich. It's a condensed version of the book. It's not 10 hours. It's like 30 minutes. And if you're serious about this, I'd like you to listen to that audio once a day for the next 30 days. Just once a day. You can do it while you're driving to work or driving home. You can do it while you're walking the dog, while you're exercising, you can do it while you're taking a shower. You can play it in the background. I don't care if you consciously pay attention to it. I just want it playing for at least 30 minutes a day. Do you know why it works, even though you're not paying conscious attention to it? Anybody? Why does it work? Because you're doing it often, every day. Every yeah. day. Why, why does it work? It works because... The subconscious mind sleeps when? Never. 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 So it's always listening. When you're sound asleep, have you ever had a loud noise wake you up while you were sleeping? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Who woke you up? Did the neighbor come over your house and knock on the door? Or did your subconscious mind awaken you? Mm. It wasn't your conscious mind. That was sleeping but your subconscious mind never goes to sleep. So if you play it in the background, who's That's still listening? Mm -hmm. You may not be listening to it consciously, but who is listening? Your subconscious. Your subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to affect is the subconscious mind. Okay. So moving forward a little bit. So faith is a state of mind which may be induced by auto-suggestion. Mm -hmm. So all down through the ages, the religionists have admonished struggling humanity to have faith in this, that, and the other dogma or creed. But they have failed to tell people how to have faith. Haven't they? I agree with that. Would everybody here agree that they haven't told us yeah. how this really works? Absolutely. They have not stated that faith is a state of mind that may be induced or created by auto-suggestion, which another word for auto-suggestion is also self-suggestion, affirmation, incantation, self-talk. These are all the same thing. So before we begin, you should be reminded again that faith is the eternal elixir, which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. So how important is it to create faith? Absolutely. So here's one of the things. The proof is simple and easily demonstrated. It is wrapped up in the principle of auto-suggestion. Let us now center our attention, therefore, on the subject of self-suggestion and find out what it is and what it is capable of achieving. It is a well-known fact that one comes finally to believe whatever one repeats to oneself whether the statement be true or false. If we repeat a lie over and over, we will eventually accept the lie's truth. Moreover, we will believe it to be the truth. Each of us is what we are because of the dominating thoughts which we permit to occupy our mind. 
thoughts which we deliberately place in our own mind and encourage with sympathy and with which we mix any or more of the emotions constitute the motivating forces which direct and control our every movement, act, and deed. So whatever we repeat over and over again with emotion will become our reality. Right now, you can look at your life and if what you see is not, see what we are is we're all outer directed people. In the book, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, you can get a free copy if you Google it. And I would strongly suggest that you read it. It's a very short read. He tells us that what we do is we look at our, our external life and we think that's our internal life. But what is really our environment is merely a looking glass. What is our environment, our, re our outside environment reflecting? Does anybody know? Our internal world. Be right there. Say that again, if you would. Our internal world. That's right. When Napoleon Hill said thoughts are things, what he's saying is that our outside world is a reflection of our inner thoughts. What, what we, if we don't have the money, if we don't have the house, if we don't have the relationships, it's not because of the outside world. It's because of what's going on in here. If you want those things, then you must change the way you think and you can only change the way you think through auto suggestion by voluntarily in placing in your mind the right thoughts. Everybody get that? Say yeah. 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 This is really critical stuff that you have to learn. Yes. So a thought magnetized with emotion may be compared to a seed when planted in fertile soil, germinates, grows, and multiplies itself over and over again until that which was originally one small seed becomes countless millions of seeds of the same kind. So the, what is the seed in this example? The seed is any idea, plan, or purpose. Those three things, idea, plan, or purpose. What is it that we use to fertilize that seed? Two things, what are they? Repetition. Repetition and emotion. No. So if we can't have, em what is the strongest emotion that we can use when we use our statement? Faith, right? What is faith? Believe. believe believe but if but in the beginning are we going to believe what we're saying no no so what we have to find a different emotion that we can use so what emotion is the closest to faith or belief anybody know joy okay that's a good one anybody love. else love love Yep. The three most powerful emotions are love, faith, and sex. Bring to Mr. Hill. But the one we can use is enthusiasm. You ever been at a football game at a sporting event? When people are yelling out, are they enthusiastic? Yeah. When they're not PO'd? Yeah. So we can say it enthusiastically. And how do we generate enthusiasm? I'm doing it right now. What am I doing to generate enthusiasm? Movement. Movement. Get excited. get excited. What do I do to get excited? Uh, what envision, goes up? Envision. Uh, what my voice, are. right? My voice goes out. So you can't do auto suggestion like this. It is my birthday, February 20th, 2023. And I, Bert Hernandez, I'm so happy and good. Why will that not work? There's no emotions in it. 
<laughs> yeah, there was an emotion. It's called boredom. <laughs> yes, not, All right. So when I say my statement, I'm going to say it is my birthday, February 20th, 2023. And I, Bert Hernandez, am so happy and grateful now that I'm receiving in excess of $100,000 each and every month consistently from my real estate investments, online businesses, insurance agency, mastermind coaching, and other income streams. So that's how you do it. You do it with enthusiasm and you say it out loud. The key is to affirmation is to do it out loud. If you can, you can do repetition so quietly to yourself by reading it, but it's not a, it's in addition to, not instead of. You still have to do it at least five times a day. And the way you do that is you set your alarm to go off five times a day. You with me? Everybody follow me? Yep. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So all you have to do is do it out loud. And when the thoughts come up that you're not going to be able to do it and all that, you just drown it out. How do we drown it out? We use our statement. We read it again. And we read it until all the negative thoughts, because what did Napoleon Hill say? He said, fear and faith cannot exist in the mind at the same time. You can't be thinking positive thoughts and thinking negative thoughts at the same time. When somebody says to you they're depressed, what are they thinking about? Depressing thoughts, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the mo one of the most important things that in this chapter is uh, one of the things that he notices that lack of confidence is the biggest handicap and weakness, and it can be easily overcome and it's done through the aid of the principle of auto suggestion so how do we overcome what what is self-confidence define self-confidence for me quickly somebody um you can do something well you know you can belief self-confidence is belief in yourself isn't it it's self-belief self-confidence so how do, so would it stand to reason that we need to become more confident? Every dis, if you don't have confidence in your ability to do something, will you attempt it? No. no, you won't because you don't believe you can do it. Whether you believe you can or cannot, you're right. So confidence is very important. So we want to affirm and use the self-confidence formula. I call it the one-two punch. The left hand is the statement and the right knockout punch is the self-confidence formula. Why is the self-confidence formula important? Because of the because of one, two, and three, and four. I don't even do five anymore because five has some negatives in it and I don't want to affirm those because I don't want to be talking about um, I you know things like uh, jealousy. Uh, you know, it says. Um, did it, I will eliminate hatred, jealousy, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for humanity. I don't want to affirm the negatives, so I leave it out completely. So I say first, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose. Therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action towards attainment, and I here and now promise to render such action. What is that saying? That I am going to do this. Second, I know, I realize, this is, I realize, but mine says, I know that the dominating thoughts of my mind will reproduce themselves. I took out eventually, will reproduce themselves in outward physical action and transform themselves into physical reality. Therefore, I concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating in my mind a clear mental picture of that person. So what am I saying with number two? What am I repeating to myself? Give me one word of the principle that number two is all about. Dominating thoughts of my mind. What is that? Auto suggestion. Number two is about auto suggestion. I realize that the dominating thoughts of my mind, how do I get my dominating thoughts of my mind through auto suggestion? Will reproduce themselves in outward physical action. What does that mean? That if I affirm that I am confident, that I am persistent, that I'm a man of action, my body will take over and I will become those things because of the repetition. Third, I know through the principle of auto-suggestion that any desire that I persistently hold in my mind 
will seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it. Therefore, I devote, the, therefore, I will devote 10, I devote, I leave out the will. I devote 10 minutes daily to demanding of myself the development of self-confidence. So number two and number three are about auto-suggestion. Why do you think Mr. Hill wants to keep affirming auto-suggestion? Because that's the basis of everything. That's right. It's the keystone or the arch of the philosophy. Fourth, I've clearly written down a, a description of my definite purpose in life. He says definite chief aim. I change it to definite purpose in life, and I will and I will and I shall never stop until I don't. I leave out trying. I shall never stop until I. Uh, what does it say here? I'm confusing myself. Until I have developed sufficient self confidence, and I. Um, fourth, I, I I have clearly written down a description of my definite purpose in life. And I and I will I sh I sh I will never stop trying. I I shall not. Ugh, I'm getting confused with that. I shall never. I shall never stop until I shall never stop. Wait a minute. Yeah, I shall never stop until I develop sufficient self confidence for its attainment. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite purpose in life, and I will never stop until I have developed sufficient self confidence for its attainment. Then I jump to number six. I sign my name to this formula, committed to memory, repeated aloud daily, with full faith that it is increased, that it is, <clears throat> that it is um, influencing my thoughts and actions, affirming that I am a self-confident, strong, powerful, confident, and successful multimillionaire and man of action. I thank you, God, for it is done. So at the end of these things, we use an expression of gratitude to universal intelligence. And I say, thank you, God, for it is done, because it is done. I'm affirming that this has already happened. So you want to, and if you want, I'll, I'll send you all a link to the, the, the correct, the newest version of the self-confidence formula. Uh, I do suggest that you read that at least twice a day, uh, morning and night. Um, you can say it out loud. You can say it silently to yourself. I really don't care. Obviously, the best is to read it out loud. Um, and if you do that, you will see things changing very quickly. Do the self-confidence formula twice a day for 30 yes. days and your life will change. I've had people that only did, uh, Albert uh, did this when I first brought him into the group and he was unemployed at the time, uh, had been unemployed for five or six months, started doing the self-confidence formula. And by January 15th, he had 15 job offers. And we didn't get to get him on board with a statement, but we got him on board with the self-confidence formula while we finished up the statement. And he, at the end, he said that, you know, I told him to get to the interviews 15, 20 minutes early to get out of his car, go outside, he lives in California and scream that self-confidence for him. That's what he did. What was I doing? I was replacing the negative thoughts of they're not going to like me. I'm not going to get this job with what? These thoughts, right? Okay. So all I'm doing is controlling your thinking to some degree. So chapter two, the chapter on faith is real simple. Back of this formula is a law of nature, which no one has been able to explain. It has baffled the scientists of all agents. The psychologists have named this the law of auto-suggestion and let it go at that. So again, self-confidence formula works because of auto-suggestion. If you read this chapter, it talks, the chapter on faith talks a lot about auto-suggestion, doesn't it? If you fill your mind with fear, doubt, and unbelief in your ability to connect with and use the forces of infinite intelligence, then the law of auto-suggestion will take the spirit of unbelief and use it as a pattern by which your subconscious mind will translate it into its physical equivalent. That's, that's the same as saying that if all you do is focus on negatives, you're going to get more negatives. Oh, Albert's on the call. So he, he just, if you look in the chat group, he just said, uh, true story. What I just said about Albert and the self-confidence formula, and not getting it and and uh, using it to uh, get multiple offers. So if you look at your chat group, you'll see Albert basically verifying what the story I just said. So the chapter on faith is a very important chapter, um, and in order for you to be, you know, I, I last call I said that. Um, there's a book called The Luck Factor. And what The luck factor, luck, luck factor talks about is that people that are lucky believe themselves to be lucky. There's another program called A Course in Miracles, which is more religious bent. But what they discovered is that people who believe in miracles have miracles happen. 
people that don't believe in miracles, they don't get a miracle. Shit is interesting, isn't it? Hmm. We manifest what we believe. In fact, he says, faith is the cornerstone of every great religion. And then he goes on in the chapter in faith and uh, talks about Andrew Carnegie's uh, protege, uh, Albert Schwab. And by the way, Albert Schwab became very successful, became president of the newly formed U US Steel Company. But then later on, because he stopped following the principles, he became an alcoholic and I think he committed suicide. So he didn't internalize the concepts the way that we should. So the chapter on faith, the main takeaways from the chapter on faith is the importance of emotionalizing your statement and the self-confidence formula of do, using auto-suggestion because auto-suggestion is the only known method of inducing that state of mind called faith. And so these two chapters do two things. They Number one, the chapter on desires to crystallize your thinking, to determine exactly what you want in life, to get you to understand that you need to start the process of auto-suggestion. The chapter on faith is to basically tell you that you have to use emotion when you auto-suggest and that you need to build your self-confidence up. And that can be done by impressing the thought of self-confidence in your mind over and over again until it becomes your dominant thought. And then what happens? Once you believe it, you will achieve it. And then finally, we have, uh... so we develop, riches begin in the form of thought. The amount is limited by only by the person in whose mind the thought is put into motion. Faith removes limitations. So when you do your statement, you're gonna get negative thoughts. I can't do this, it's not happening fast enough. You need to say to yourself, this will happen. It's not a matter of if it happens, it's just a matter of when. And I just have to be persistent in saying my, doing the auto suggestion. All it is is 30 minutes a day and you'll have whatever you want in life. And what will happen is as you begin to understand and apply this science, you will begin achieving goals and each goal will be bigger than the last goal. And what you'll realize is that you do have the power to control and shape your destiny and that you can have anything you want in life, no matter how young or old you believe you are, because age is really insignificant. It's just the number. It's how many times the planet has circled the, the sun, right? That's it. So it has nothing to do with your ability to do something unless you have infirmities and then that's a different story. So the next week we're going to discuss the chapter on auto suggestion and we're going, and that's a short chapter. What I suggest everybody do is again, the assignment is to, uh, when you receive the link tomorrow is begin listening. Bob Proctor, what he did is he put his gold card in his pocket. So take a, take your statement and not, I don't think any of you picked up the template, shame on you guys, but write your statement as best you can. Uh, make sure that it's in present tense language um, and take that statement, the, the financial part and put it on a index card or a business card and carry it with you so that you can look at it several times a day or, or put it on your cell phone in the notes section so you can look at it multiple times a day and remind yourself to do that. Go for doing your statement five times a day, doing the self-confidence formula twice a day and looking at your goal card or, or your goal note in your notes phone, uh, phone as many times as possible during the day so that you're constantly thinking about what it is you want and you get your mind off of the things you don't want. All right, any questions? Yeah, when we constantly see the 30 minutes a day, is that like a combined 30 minutes a day or are you supposed to actually set aside 30 minutes a day? At you set aside 30 minutes and you close your eyes and you go, it is my birthday, February 20th. And then you begin to visualize, you know, receiving that $100,000 a month using that beautiful Sea Ray 360 Sundancer down the Florida coast and other ports of calls. You see yourself driving that Mercedes Benz SL 550 convertible, white with a beige interior. You see yourself living on the condo on the beach three bedroom, two baths, nine, uh, 1,200 square feet with a beautiful, gorgeous view of the coast of, of, the, of the Gulf Coast of Mexico. 
And that's what you do is you, you visualize yourself. That's why you want to get to either record your statement so you can play it back and visualize yourself or memorize it, which is ultimately what you want to do. And so that you can just close your eyes and do your statement. I do mine before I go to bed at night. I go, you know, in order to sleep eight hours, you can't go to bed. You know, if you got to get up, you know, if you want to get up at six in the morning or seven, I get up at seven. If you want to get up at seven, that means you need to be in bed by 11, but you can't go to bed by 11 because you don't go to sleep like that. So you go to bed maybe at 1030 and now you have a half hour to unwind. And that half hour while I'm unwinding, I take my ear buds, I take my iPod, I put it, plug in my ear, and I just listen to my statement while I relax. And I've added music to my statement. There's a, um, there's a piece of uh, equipment you can download for free. It's called Audacity. And then you can grab music from anywhere. There's tons of free music that are relaxing music, and you can add it to your statement so that relaxes you. But we'll talk about that on another call, and I'll show you how to create that. So next week, the chapter on auto-suggestion. It's the shortest chapter in the book. And I want you to also begin reading the chapter on specialized knowledge, which is chapter four or five, depending on which version. And specialized knowledge is what will happen or what needs to happen in order to help you create the plan to achieve your goal. And we'll discuss how to use that. And then after that, what's our next chapter after that? Anybody know? What comes after specialized knowledge? Imagination. Imagination. I think it was uh, Dr. Um, William James, the father of modern day psychology that said, when the will and the imagination are in conflict, the imagination always wins. So that means if you, the image you hold in your mind is of a fat person and you're trying to become a thin person, then your willpower, which is what you're using to try to arrive at that is going to lose because you still see yourself as that person. So you need to use the visualization process 30 minutes daily of seeing yourself as the person you want to become see yourself making the money see yourself looking at your statement your fidelity account your ira whatever it might be your 401k and seeing a million dollars there take your 401k statement and white out and, and type over one million dollars and look at that every day you know, you need to have at least a million in your 401k to retire comfortably. The real number is more like five to 10 million, but you know, and, and what I want you to think about is by what age will you have a net worth of a million dollars? And if you already have a million dollars, at what age will you have 5 million or 10 million? But you need to set a deadline on it and then put that somewhere where you will see it every day. I am so happy and grateful now that my net worth exceeds $1 million by my birthday, February 20th, 2026, let's say. And then you read that every day. You can put that on the back of your goal card. But you want to decide when you'll have a million, when you want to have 5 million. The first goal will be a million. In this country, you, it, it, it should be no problem to have a net worth of a million dollars. But you have to begin affirming it. Because I started doing that at age 25. The goal was to become a millionaire by age 30. It didn't happen until I was 34. It took four more years. It took a total of nine years to get there. So what? You can do it much faster today than you could back then. But you have to start affirming it because you have to begin believing it. So I don't say I'm a millionaire anymore. I say I'm a multimillionaire and I love it. Multimillionaire. My buddy um, says I am a billionaire and I love it. And, and I just said he's playing one-upmanship. But you got to start affirming. So start today. Decide that you're going to be a millionaire and by when. It could be a 10-year goal like Bob Proctor's. He made it $25,000. Eventually, he made a million in five years. So could you do that? Sure. You have to just believe it and affirm it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let you all go. It, was, it has been a blast as always. I hope you uh, 
got some value out of this course. Anybody before we go have any questions? Is it too I wish late? You a happy New Year. Oh, say that again. Me or uh, either? The offer that you had last week is that still available? Yep, I will um, email everybody a link tomorrow, um, so you can go ahead and grab it. Uh, the offer was basically to give you the template for the self for the um, statement and also a free review. Uh, the only thing I ask is that when you write it, you place it into a Google Doc and then you share it with me with the ability to edit it so I can go in and make changes for you. And that way you'll have the statement. And if it's on Google Docs, that means that you can retrieve it on your cell phone. So while you're sitting on the toilet, you know, my buddy said, uh, women can do this much easier than men. Because women, when they go to the bathroom, they sit and men stand. And I said, well, you can sit down and pee. There's no, there's no law that says a man can't sit down and pee. Um, and, and then you can read your statement, right? Because what you want to do is you want to keep reinforcing it. So maybe you don't read it out loud while you're in, in the toilet, unless you're at home or, you know, a, a private area. But you can still read it. And it's better than, because what, do us, what does everybody do today when they go to the bathroom? Most part, what do we do? Come on, I'm holding it up. What do we do? Our phones. <laughs> yeah, we're checking out Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, checking emails, responding to text messages, right? Don't we all do that? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's not just me, right? It's no. <laughs> so why not take no, a it's minute? it's just you. Huh? It's, it's just, just you. Me. It's just me. I knew it. I'm a weird one. So we can take a minute to first, you know, I have a shortcut on my desktop here, right to my statement. Now it's memorized, but I have it on my home screen for one reason. And that is, I look at my home screen probably more than I look at any other part of this phone. And so when I see it there, I remind myself what? Why do billboards, does any, anybody ever see a billboard on the road? Sure. Why do they work? Because you see them and you see them and you see them. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a little billboard. You know, if I showed you, you know, I'm, I'm a kook because what I do is I take certain things and today it's much easier than when I was growing up. I take certain things and I type them up on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And it says by January 15th, 2023, I'm so happy and grateful. And there's my goal. I have a goal for January 15th and I put it up right on the back of the door to my apartment. And I made a decision. My sister and I have gotten closer and closer. And that's a long story. But in any case, I've made a decision that in 2023, I will be moving to closer to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and that's because she lives in Weston and my son lives in Jupiter. So it'll be easier to visit with them. So, um, you know, that's one of my goals. So what, what you affirm, listen, if I can share, if, if I could take what's in my heart and mind and give it to you, I would. And, but take me on my word that this process works. This took me from a salesman that was on the verge of quitting to winning three president citations, which is top 10%. I was in the top 10% as a sales manager. I was in the top 10% as a district manager. And ultimately I was promoted to regional vice president, which is the next position after regional vice president is senior vice president and then president. So I was only two heartbeats away from running Prudential. Um, if only I'd own a sniper rifle right now, only kidding. Um, but the thing is that, how did I do that? I took the principles and thinking were which I applied them in my life. And then I taught it to my salespeople. And as they succeeded, I succeeded. And then I taught it to my district managers. And then I taught it to nobody else. I taught it to my employees in my insurance agency. And then in 2012, 2013, I had an experience that made me want to share it with people outside of people that worked for me. And that's when I started the Think and Grow Rich group. That's when I started doing these calls and doing other calls and doing a whole bunch of stuff. I've cut back from that because back then I had more free time 
uh, because of my health issues, I couldn't work. But now I, I have a lot of different uh, plates spinning, so I don't have as much time as I do. But I hope that all of you take to heart what I'm sharing with you and, and understand that you what you want to do is you want to read Think and Grow Rich 10 to 15 times. Because when you read it that many times, then you'll understand it. One reading will not do it. It's bad enough that it's written in 1800 style of American writing. It's not as clear. That's why this version I use because it's much easier to understand. So read, read to, if you haven't read yet, read tonight 10 pages. That's what I used to do is I set a goal to read 10 pages a day. That's it, just 10. Every night I read 10 pages. Today I'll pick a specific chapter like, Right now, I'm doing uh, sec uh, The Strangest Secret for 30 days, and I'm doing Think and Grow Rich by Earl Nightingale for 30 days. So every day for 30 days, I listen to it. That's it. You know, I just play it in the background while I'm driving, whatever. And I always read 10 pages. Now, some days I might pick the chapter on persistence, because what do I know? I know that any idea, plan or purpose or desire that I persistently hold in my mind. So if I'm reading the chapter on the persistence, what am I impressing on my subconscious mind? Nobody? Um, persistence. Persistence, to be more persistent. And if, I pers and if I impress it upon my subconscious mind over and over again, I'm going to become more persistent. So by reading the chapter on persistence, I reinforce in my mind to be more persistent. And the first place you have to be persistent in is in doing the daily reading, doing your <coughs> affirmation, suggestions, your, your DMPS, your definite main purpose statement. The more you do that over and over again, the faster you're going to manifest. But if you choose to ignore this, and I know, and, and, and you may say, Bert, why are you harping on this so much? Because 100 million people have read this book. 100 million have read this book. 100 million people have read this book. And do you know how many of them actually wrote down their goals and applied it? What does Napoleon Hill say? Two out of 100 will have goals, a purpose. Has that changed? In over 60 something years since the book was published, it hasn't changed one bit. You could tomorrow morning walk up to somebody who is a stranger and say, hey, I'm curious, what's your goal in life? And you watch if what they say sounds something like, oh, to be happy, to make more money. None of them will say, my goal is to make $100,000 a month each and every month consistently. They, don't, they can't say that because they don't know it. So you know, don't be confused because some sometimes you'll see, like in The Secret, I see this guy, uh, John Asroff, and he says, you know, this secret works to manifest. I took a vision board and I put a picture of the house I wanted. And then I packed it up when we moved and I never saw it again. And then five years later, we were moving into a new house and it was the exact same house that I had on my vision board. Now you may say, wow, that's amazing. And you know what I say? Bullshit. You know why? Try to go to a shooting range and hit a target without seeing it. Close your eyes. Try to, try to touch your nose with your eyes closed. A little easier, but still difficult if you're drinking. The key is that you can only achieve what you see, what you maintain in your mind. If you think of it once and then forget about it, come on, you think that's going to manifest? If that was the case, I'd still get that bicycle I wanted when I was 10 years old. Come on. You know, I wanted a G.I. Joe with the Rock'em Sock'em robot thing. You know, still wanted that. I thought about it every day. It never came. Damn Santa. <laughs> Didn't come this year either. I want to knock your block off. With, remember the Rock'em Sock'em robot? I knew that. was fun. <laughs> yeah. I had, I got the G.I. Joe. My dad got me the G.I. Joe. Well, Santa got me the G.I. Joe. It was G.I. Joe with a parachute. I was so excited. I went oh, outside, I tied the string around, the way you're supposed to do it is you tied the parachute around the, the toy, you throw it up in the air, and then the parachute opens and he drops down. 
So I did that. That's what the commercial said. I grabbed, the, threw it up in the air and GI Joe floated away and I never sold my. <laughs> and I told my dad and he said, well, Santa must have taken his toy back. <laughs> I'm waiting for GI Joe to drop in. You know, maybe someday he'll pop here. But anyway, all right. So remember, you're only going to get that which you put in order to possess it. You must obsess it. Possession is obsession. If you don't, Bert, obsess, maybe, you're not going to obsess. Over. Or maybe Bert, he was thinking about it. He was visualizing it throughout the whole years. Maybe he didn't have the vision board. Is that a possibility? Or Say you that again? Could it be that possibly he had a mental lockdown on what he it could be? He didn't. Yeah, it could be. I mean, he didn't say that. He said he was talking about the vision board. So I take him literally because I, I, I feel like that that's a little bit, you know, too excessive for him to say that he put it away and he didn't see it. You, he, the, you know, know there, there's a mixture, between the, mar there's a mixture between the marketing and the reality. Right. True, true, true. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, and then Bert, when you get a chance, um, let's let's talk offline uh, maybe for the next session um we'll do a couple of posts on my uh thinking grow rich um instagram handle and then maybe we'll get more people to come through but we'll chat i'll send you email i had i had 60 time. people sign up it seems like we get 20 to show up which is about average about 30 percent 30 percent of the people actually uh per actually follow through that's cool. Anything. No, I mean, I just send I, I webinars just or anything like that. It's usually about thirty percent. So, in order to get, I can only I'm maxed out at fifty or hundred. I forget which. So let's say it's a hundred. So the, the most I can invite would be three hundred, and I could do that. All I have to do is just do some advertising. But uh, I have people in the group. There's over two hundred and fifty nine people in the, on the email list. Uh, total, I think I have. Uh, over 12 or 13,000 people on my email lists from multiple uh, offers and stuff like that. But, you know, 60, 64 signed up and 20 show up. So that's okay. Yeah, that's cool. No, I mean, I just wanted to- you know, But I appreciate it. I do. Reach out to me, message me later because I don't, I don't can't see your name. Um, Ooh, this is Bahid. I'm, I, I'll, I'll reply to your email. Uh, all right, cool. All right, we'll all right, any other questions? Anybody before we go? No, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, Just to everybody a happy new year. Yeah, yes, happy new year. that's right. That'll be happening shortly. So get excited because 2023 is your year. Only if you decide it is. That's the only thing you have to do. Decide. Decide it's your year. Affirm that it's your year and it will be your year. Make it happen. All right, everybody. You have a great night. Happy new year. We'll talk Good. soon. Bye-bye.